It's Tuesday the 22nd of May 2018 and this is your EV News Daily. Well, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Wherever you're listening around the world, a very warm welcome from London in the UK. Here is today's news about electric cars and the future of transports. I go through every EV article I can find online so you don't have to. Coming up on today's show, BMW's i3 batteries are performing some storage tasks and why more people would have bought an EV if it wasn't for dealers. Uh, but first of all, a little note of the people that I tend to follow online have a lot of them, the kind of car magazines, the car reviewers, uh, Robert Llewellyn, all talking about test driving the Jaguar I-Pace today. Looks like they've been driving it on streets and off-road as well. Like some real rough terrain and also driving it on track. Everyone is clearly under embargo, not allowed to talk about it, but I've seen a couple of sort of pictures taken on smartphones type thing. And I've seen a couple of people saying, this is incredible. It's going to blow people away. The iPace is just stunning. Without saying too much, everyone saying some very complimentary things about the Jaguar iPace from those reviews. Now, you may know that uh, journalists have been inside the iPace at the Geneva Motor Show, but it was a highly controlled, staged thing where you had to drive from post to post and in between cones, and it was over within a couple of minutes. So this is the very first chance people have got to jump in a Jaguar iPace and really put it, th- it, put it through. It's, uh, <coughs> pardon, the pun paces. Yep, I really went there. Uh, But let's get on to the news proper today. And the world's largest battery and car charging network was unannounced yesterday. Unannounced? It was announced yesterday in the UK. Now, you may know that Tesla have been busy uh, with their battery packs down under in the megawatt scale. But in the UK, they want to build the UK's first two gigawatt battery connected storage the world's largest battery and vehicle charging network and I, you know i'm proud of being in the uk and making the podcast from here but i'm i must admit slightly surprised we're not the most forward country in terms of things like that we've got a bit of renewables going on because we're the windiest country in in europe but still that's a pleasant surprise to see so how are they going to do this well they're going to do this with 50 megawatt sites and there's going to be 45 of them So a new British firm are going to put 45 sites around the country, grid-scale 50 megawatt batteries connected to substations, which then connect them to the uh, the grid. £1.6 billion is going to be the cost of this. Some very rough maths, about two billion US dollars, give or take. And it follows news recently of the UK, or Britain at least, saying they want to ban petrol and diesel pure combustion cars, of course, they are allowing hybrids, uh, by 2040. And although Tesla's 129 megawatt hour battery has been helping Australia, this does look like it's going to be a real uh, headline generator uh, when they start to come online. They will start to come online in 2019, next year. Southampton, which is not too far from uh, where I live, down on the south coast, actually, uh, it's about half an hour away. It's a, a big port here in the UK. Most of our shipped goods come in and out of Southampton on uh, on some big ships. Uh, so that's going to be the first one. Now, its founders are Matt Allen and Michael Clark, and they've got some big, big backers, as you can imagine uh, with this. Mr. Allen said this, and I quote, the primary focus is to develop the network, but in tandem, engage with the electric vehicle supply chain. There's an opportunity for charge points to operate under a different brand. Now, the green energy entrepreneur, Michael Liebrich, has been backing the project as well, and soon uh, they're going to open it up to retail investors through the uh, investment house Downing. That's going to be from the autumn if you want to put some of your own money into this. They're going to roll out 10 of their mega batteries in the first 18 months and they're going to power these public charging stations. So they're going to have grid-connected massive batteries which will also be connected to a bunch of EV chargers. Therefore, there's no spike when people turn up to work or these large places wherever these the 10 sites are going to be, the first 10. And if they can persuade lots of EV, incentivize lots of EV owners to be using their chargers, no effect at all on the grid, no spike on the grid uh, because it's all going to be stored power. Uh, Mr. Allen also said this, and I quote, big problems require big solutions, and we're moving fast to put in place a unique network to support a clean, affordable, secure energy system and embrace the low-carbon 
economy. And although this is happening in the UK, I don't imagine it's going to be very long before other investors start to um, run their rulers over what we're doing in the UK. And you're going to see this cropping up in many other countries as well very soon. If there's money to be made in this project, I don't think we're going to be the only ones doing it. But on a smaller scale, let's move on to our next story. And I, and I love this because in comparison, it is quite small to what we've just talked about. But otherwise, on any other day, it'd be a huge story. Uh, the UK uh, is now home to the largest EV reused energy storage uh, project. Vattenfall has connected 500 old BMW i3 batteries in Wales. There's an onshore wind farm in Wales at uh, Pen y Kimoid. That's probably really bad Welsh. And they've connected these 500 old i3 batteries to that for some storage, which smooths out uh, the feed into the grid. And, of course, renewable energy. Uh, the wind can blow for a couple of days, then it can drop off for a few hours, then it can... All those kind of things. And it just provides that regular feed into the grid. And it's a fantastic example of how some car makers, don't you think? Some car makers that are already trying these things are going to be the ones that survive and thrive in the future and the ones that aren't dipping their toe in the water that aren't working out the economics of these things that aren't going into partnerships with onshore wind farms like bmw and vattenfall to go okay so how could we do this in 10 15 years time on a massive scale the kind of car companies that are going hey we're making our first hybrid soon maybe are they going to be around at some point in the future well, uh, moving on, and I mentioned this at the start of the show, a lot more electric cars should be on the roads. Now, I'm not saying that they, they should be on the roads because yeah, they should be on the roads. We know that. But actually, a new study shows there should be a lot more EVs on the road. These are researchers from the University of Sussex here in the UK and the University of Aarhus in Denmark. And they put a project together uh, with some mystery shoppers and they went into car dealerships. In one dealership, they say, uh, one of their mystery shoppers was told, don't purchase an EV, it will ruin you financially. Another dealer told these mystery buyers, electric cars can only go 80 kilometres, don't buy one of those buy one of these petrol or diesel cars. Uh, it's in an article for the science journal Nature Energy. If you want to look up the uh, the full thing, it's the academics that carried it out. Uh, did 126 shopping experiences. They used 82 dealerships and they did it across Europe, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, which is the home of electric cars, Sweden as well. And they said this, dealers were dismissive of electric vehicles. They misinformed shoppers on vehicle specifications. They omitted EVs from the entire conversation and strongly oriented customers towards petrol and diesel options. Maybe you've had an experience similar to this. Well, share it. I'd love to hear your comments on the blog or YouTube or any of those channels that you can get the podcast. Have you had a similar thing where you went in knowing exactly what you wanted? They tried to steer you away from something, but... You were knowledgeable, whereas actually maybe some other buyers were going in and they could have made a better choice. But car, ch car dealerships don't want to sell you an EV. Now, why is this? Well, you and I wouldn't be geniuses for working out. It's just not in their interest. They can sell you a petrol or diesel car and they're going to be coming back very often to have one of the many thousands of bits serviced, replaced, possibly upgraded uh, with all the moving bits and oil and combustion that's going on. With an EV, that revenue, it's just not there. So why would they sell you? If it's if if they've got a choice, unless you're Tesla and you only sell EVs, unless you're Mercedes, for instance, and you have a whole new, they're talking about whole bits of their showroom, which are just going to be for the EQ brands with very specialised saleswomen and men. If you're just at a dealership where you've just got to hit your monthly or your quarterly target, what are you going to do? It's not so much shocking, but when you read the full thing, and I'll put a link to the whole thing, by the way, in case you want to read all the details, it is a little bit irritating. Well, when you do finally buy an EV and you plug it into some public chargers, well, there's every chance you'll be using the Open Charge protocol. It's open source, and it's the Open Charge Alliance. Uh, it's called the Open Charge Point Protocol, OCPP. And it's uh, pretty widely used by different manufacturers of charging stations, of operators of charging stations, and they've just released 
released version 2. And it should mean that you get a better charging experience when this starts to roll out to the chargers uh, which you would use. The public chargers offers better device management and, and you can do better things. Uh, the charging operators uh, have got more control over that. There's more transaction handling on this which will certainly be welcomed uh, by those operators. Added security which is always needed uh, these days. Uh, the smart charging functionalities have been added to this second gen uh, open source code support for and get this i've never heard of this and i'm going to do some big reading up on it as soon as we finish recording the podcast do you know what 15118 or 15118 or 15118 that set of numbers it's got support for it i've never heard of it before i'm gonna do some big research on that now and find out what it is it's a, a plug and charge requirement for evs I don't know about it. Uh, display and messaging support and more and more of those as well. And the great thing about this is is it is an open standard, open source, uh, royalty-free, patent-free, like Tesla released their patents. And I love that that is the kind of thing that you're finding in the EV community. Well, thank you so much for listening today. I do hope you enjoyed it, and I do hope that you would love to spread the word about electric cars like I love doing. So please share the podcast with somebody who might be interested. All the previous ones are on iTunes, on Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, tune in, Stitcher. Stitcher's finally working again. Yay! Uh, also, SoundCloud, uh, iHeartRadio Podcasts, and the blog at evnewsdaily.com. If you subscribe, you get them first and free and automatically. And on our socials, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, search EV News Daily. Have a wonderful day, and I'll catch you tomorrow.